So, Zach, we got to set something straight before we start the show. Okay. Yes, yes. It's okay to call Frankenstein's monster Frankenstein. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you brought this up because I was going to make the same clarification. We know, we know. If you want to be correct, it's Frankenstein's monster. Look, look, the only people that really care about that are people that want to pretend to sound literate, okay? Half of them haven't even read the books, uh, haven't even read Mary Shelley in their entire life, um, and just want to sound smart and pedantic. And um, yeah, it doesn't make you interesting at parties because you say Frankenstein's monster instead of Frankenstein. Um, just stop. No one likes you. Um, all of the stuff that I am covering not only calls him Frankenstein, two of my things call him Dr. Frankenstein and they're referring oh. to the monster. Oh. So, uh, yeah, That's confusing. <laughs> to add even more confusion to it. But look, even Universal, when they're licensing this stuff, the trademark is Frankenstein. They don't say Frankenstein's monster. Yes, I know the original credits called him the monster, but all of the merchandising they do, and they're, they're pretty much the standard um, for Frankenstein merchandise because they really protect their version of Frankenstein. Yeah. That's why you don't see neck bolts in a lot of uh, non-universal Frankensteins because they'll fucking sue your ass. And I, I and, did not know that, but that is a good point. You really don't. Yeah. Um, so they're Frankenstein, green skin, tall, flat head, bolts and neck, scar on forehead. That's all stuff they have likeness trademarked. Mm. Bride of Frankenstein, the hair with the lightning bolt design. Um, yeah. that is trademarked by them as well. And they will sue you for it. And they have, they've gone after people for it. That's why, uh, Frank and weenie, the bride of Frank and weenie doesn't have the exact same hair. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's a thing. Uh, so we're going to talk about Frankenstein today. And when we do, we're probably talking about the monster. At least all of my shit is Zach's will vary. <laughs> my mine will, will vary but if i'm talking about the doctor i'll probably try and say dr frankenstein and in my case it will be the doctor or i'll say victor frankenstein if i don't know if victor frankenstein is actually in any of the things i'm talking about so what we're doing today well welcome to another mishful podcast horror decomposed the pumpkin scented intersection of horror and pop culture with me today as always my esteemed colleague hailing from tromaville usa professor casey that makes me sound like I'm from New Jersey. I'm from California, dog. I'm like <laughs> I'm like West Coast Tromaville or something. You, you know? have like yeah, good. that's 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 true. That's true. Uh, and my name is Zach. Chris again could not make it this week. He fell into a state of a uh, euphoric static shock because Edgar Wright retweeted him, uh, and he's yet to emerge from it. So hopefully he'll emerge from it soon, and he'll be with us uh, next time we record. But uh, he's he's doing well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He, it sucks. He's not here for what will be our second most listened to episode in the history of the, the reason I say that is because our Dracula episode that was like, this is our number one episode. Uh, for some reason, we don't really know why. Uh, I mean, it's Dracula, I liked it. man. It's yeah. Dracula. I liked it. I was proud of it. Um, yeah. so yeah, um, we can do Frankenstein and do the same kind of thing. And the next one we'll put up for vote, you know, you, you can't. Yeah. So this is going to be, the start of a one themed or rep retrospective show a month. So we're really excited about that, but you can't have a Dracula episode and not talk about Frankenstein and we could easily do another Dracula and pop culture episode as well. Same with this. So if you guys want to see more of these, there's so much to dig from, but let's just talk about what is your earliest memory of Frankenstein before we're going to get into our picks here. What's your earliest memory of Frankenstein, the monster or this, the, the film adaptation in general, the story, um, it would probably be him showing up in some sort of Saturday morning cartoon. Yeah. Um, uh, cause everyone put a Frankenstein in something. I mean, <laughs> yeah. even there even was a Hanna Barbera cartoon, Frankenstein jr. But that, um, uh, sucked. It was like a superhero thing. He looked like a robot. Uh, like, it was like Frankenstein and the impossibles or something like that. Yeah. It was, it was part of a double header thing, but yeah. yeah um, I, you know, like I had definitely seen the universal film pretty early on. Um, but you know, I would have been like four years old whenever I would have first been exposed to yeah. Frankenstein. It had to have been on a cartoon or something. Same. My dad recorded a lot of, you know, the early universal monster movies on VHS tape, as well mm -hmm. as like all the Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein films. And that's how, you know, Abbott and Costello meet, you know, monster mm -hmm. films. And that's how I think I initially saw 
Frankenstein's monster, probably through Abbott and Castillo meet Frankenstein, but also the Monster Squad, certainly one of the earlier yeah. appearances of his I saw. I mean, I think at Halloween, I certainly, you know, when I was a kid, saw people dressed up at his, as him and saw his, you know, picture oh, yeah. on certain things. And I had this book growing up. It was like a Where's Waldo style book called Where Are They? Uh, Find Frankie featuring Frankenstein's oh, monster. It's pretty yeah. great. I might have to post some pictures on our Twitter account of that. It's pretty, it's pretty tremendous. It's more as well, but like all the pictures are like monsters and stuff. It's awesome. It sounds tremendous. And actually. then another thing that I don't know if I've mentioned on the podcast, but I wrote an article about it on miserablepilotsecrets.com, which you can still read, is uh, Gain Wilson's Ultimate Haunted House, which is a really great old like, 90s uh, computer video game where you go through this uh, haunted mansion and you run into different monsters and you have to like, you know, give them certain objects. Your, your goal is to find like 13 keys or whatever so you can escape this house. And Frankenstein's monster is one of the monsters. And so I just certainly remember that portrayal and you can give them different things and you can like trap the monsters and traps in this house and like, uh, you know, kind of kill them sort of. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think I just that the monster is such a Frankenstein is such a just indelible like image on in Halloween in in horror movie history. He is the most classic monster, I think, without question. That is like the when you think of a monster, you're, you're thinking of Frankenstein, and I think when you're thinking of Frankenstein, there's really only one actor that has to come to mind, and that is Mr. Boris Karloff. No, no, um, you are discounting greatly how popular Glenn Strange is and his place. Uh, no, office. Glenn Strange is great. I'm just saying, when you think of Frankenstein, you think Boris Karloff first and foremost. Yeah, but. Let's put it this way. When they when they were doing Frankenstein merch for a good bulk of it was Glenn Strange, including uh, the first Don Post mask licensed was Glenn Strange. Um, we'll talk about it in one of my entries a bit, actually. Um, I'm just saying a name, the name that's synonymous with Frankenstein more than anything else is Boris Karloff. Yeah, I mean, it defined his career. Uh, yeah. Some may say ruined his career, but, uh, you know, uh, I don't think he was happy about always being the scary guy, but it got him a lot of work. Yeah, it got him a lot of work. He was he was great at it. And uh, yeah. <laughs> so today we're going to this is an interesting I think Casey and I had very different approaches to this. So. We're taking a look at just kind of the oddest, strangest, wildest, weirdest, and some of our favorite depictions of Frankenstein in pop culture. Some of these may be things that shaped us. In my case, I just kind of looked for like oddities and and just some of the oddest, like weirdest, offbeat depictions of Frankenstein in pop culture, especially in like film and TV movies. And Casey uh, went the opposite end of the spectrum. So this is going to be an interesting list. Yeah, I I didn't cover any movies or television because I don't really like covering movies and television that much. I my I signed up for this to talk about the weird fringe shit in horror, um, like collectibles, like weird tangential stuff related to the movies. So that's the weird tangential stuff you're gonna get from me today. Um, also, had to do had to do an entry on comics, because um, come on, comics. <laughs> I used to have a horror comics podcast that died a miserable death before we started this one. Um, but I have quite the collection of Frankenstein comics I'd like to talk to everyone about. <laughs> All right. Well, I might have like a bonus pick. Maybe I know I always do that. So I'm going to ask Casey, do you mind if I start things off? No, go right ahead. All right. Let's talk Frankenstein. <laughs> Okay, so I mentioned Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, mm -hmm. one of the classic comedies of all time. Probably the best Abbott and Costello Universal. Well, For definitely sure. the best. Yeah. Yeah, and and how I was one of the boys I was introduced to all the monsters. But did you know that there were a lot of knockoffs remakes kind of of Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, Casey? Yeah, and some from foreign countries. And I'm going to talk about one of those right now because I found one of them. Nice. And this is uh, an Egyptian remake of Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein called Ismail Yazin meets Frankenstein or like its actual translated title is Haram Alik, which I think means like shame on you. I've also seen it this under Have Mercy, not related to Full House. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but it stars a really beloved Egyptian comedian named Ismail Yazin. 
and he kind of plays the Lucas Dello character in this. He's also joined uh, by another actor named Abdel Fatah El Kasri. I'll just call him Abdel. So this is like Ismail and Abdel. So it's not like a shot for shot remake of Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, but it's some some scenes pretty much are ripped straight from Abbott and Costello. Mm. The scene where Lucas Costello is reading like the museum exhibit sign and the casket opens behind him and it's, you know, Dracula keeps trying mm-hmm. to get out and, you know, Costello turns around and is freaked out. That scene is ripped verbatim and uh, Ismail Gazin does a great job kind of uh, mimicking that scene. Also, the scene with like the revolving walls in uh, Dracula's kind of laboratory where they keep going back oh, and forth yeah. between the walls is, is kind of uh, remade here. But there are some differences. The werewolf character, th- that subplot is uh, portrayed a bit differently. The werewolf in this is kind of a bit more under the influence of Dracula. And I think Dracula is, is the causes him to change. There's a fun mm. interplay. There's a fun interplay with... Ismail and Abdel, where one scene, uh, Abdel dons a werewolf mask to kind of scare Ismail. And so later on, when he sees the actual werewolf, he thinks it's his buddy in the mask, nice. but it's not. So, so, so there's some good stuff here. I, um, Solid comedy right there. I like yeah, it. yeah. I had to watch this, so I found it on YouTube, and mm-hmm. it did not have subtitles. So I just had to watch oh, this shit. <laughs> without subtitles. I will say, if you've seen Abbott and Gisela meet Frankenstein, you'll be able to follow this. I just yeah, put it hey, on while I was exercising. If I could follow Mahakal just seeing Nightmare on Elm Street, <laughs> you can follow you can follow this probably, yeah. So let me get to the Frankenstein monster here, because that's kind of what this show is about. It's really interesting. Casey, I want you to look this up. Look up Ismail I S M A I L Yazin Y A S S I N E meets Frankenstein because I kind of wanted to find interesting kind of makeups of Frankenstein. And this is it has a very kind of mad monster party, almost like rank and bass stop motion look to his face, a very kind of wide sort of mouth super like round eyes it's you know certainly they didn't have a huge budget for it but it's it's weird right (laughs) he looks like fucking frankenberry dude (laughs) yeah Um, a little bit frankenberry but it is he looks like frankenberry but without a butt on the back of his head it's a very kind of cartoony looking frankenstein i will say the guy who played the monster tall as hell he must have been over seven feet you've walked around like the yeti and uh wcw (laughs) Nice. So, did, he, did he reverse butt hug somebody like the the Yeti? I don't, I don't recall that. I gotta say, the Wolfman looks pretty legit, though. It looks kind of like Paul Nashy Wolfman. Uh, looks pretty. I good. Almost, I almost covered Paul Nashy on this, but I did not. But the Wolfman was is is a good makeup. You gotta save Nashy for when we do a Wolfman episode. Then everything's good. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, this is just a really interesting oddity, and apparently Ismail Yassin started another kind of uh, sort of riff on a classic um, Hollywood, you know, um, horror comedy, the Laurel and Hardy film, A Haunting We Will Go, and I think that was made right up before this, and apparently they kind of used these two movies as a double bill, Oh, and wow. I think that's why the name like uh, Haram Ali came, it was to tie it in with the name of the other one, which is very similar titled, uh, I think it was like Halak Ali or something. I, I want to point out that I got all this info. I, the reason I have this info is there's a great blog called Die Danger Die Die Kill. Mm-hmm. Blogspot.com. Uh, I highly recommend checking that out. It's a blog on kind of you know a pop culture movie blog on movies in foreign countries and it talks a lot about Egyptian films and I think Turkish stuff and Bollywood and stuff. Mm-hmm. Sadly, according to the last post, the owner of that blog passed away. His name is uh, Todd Statman, but he's a very prolific blogger. And podcaster Casey might be interested to know this. He had a blog called The Lucha Diaries in 2006. Oh, okay. I, I've seen it. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Anyway, that's a great blog. So definitely check out Die Danger, Die Die Kill. That's how I got all this info. But yeah, Ismail Yazin meets Frankenstein. A really and, um, weird more oddity. More monster is but... looking than any monster in the movie. Uh, he, this guy has to be in the running for ugliest leading man. Ismail um, Yazin. Yeah, he's, he's he's comedic relief, man. He's he's this is you know Abbott Costello kind of thing here. So it's right, right. but he's he's really he's actually he's pretty funny. There are also some dance sequences in this film. Luke Costello was a handsome man. Ah, uh, yeah. This I can't get over this Frankenberry looking Frankenstein dude. We gotta like his eyes are so round. Yeah, it, you guys, it, you guys look up Ismail Yazin meets Frankenstein. Just you know so what you he can looks see like? What the monster he kind of looks, like. looks like the Scooby Doo weird Frankensteiny robot guy. He looks like Frankenstein Junior from um, from Hanna Barbera a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he does. I mean, obviously, you know, the Scooby Doo cartoon was kind of a riff on a lot of the you know Abigail meet Frankenstein that sort of style of film. 
I also watched Alvin and the Chipmunks meet Frankenstein. Oh, that <laughs> one this week. sucks. Yeah, I've seen it. It was, it was a little disappointing. I, I went on a journey this week, and I will I will tell you guys about this more about this journey, but I, I watched so much stuff. Um, some of it pretty perverted, so I'm not talking about most of the perverted stuff because it was just I don't know weird. What you're Googling for Frankenstein, dude, but uh all right. Uh <gasps> hey, <laughs> look, look, so anybody anybody can watch a Frankenstein movie, okay? Look, Zach, anyone can. Yeah, um, let's let's get into your pick, Casey. I met Frankenstein in person multiple, multiple times. This is this is so much more than seeing a movie. Uh, I'm talking about the walk around Frankenstein at Universal Studios uh, with some specifics. I was I was originally going to talk about like a very specific one that I've seen, mm -hmm. uh, but then I got down like a research rabbit hole and I actually find it pretty fascinating. So when you go to Universal Studios Hollywood, I don't know about Florida because they don't count. Um. I, because I've never been. Uh, they have, for my whole life, first time I went to Universal Studios was in 1986. They have always had a Frankenstein walk-around character. Sometimes they would greet you when you were on the tram. Sometimes they'd be walking around for you to take pictures with. Uh, it actually started out when I was a kid. They would have a Phantom of the Opera and a Frankenstein together. They actually have done more monsters than that. Um I, I have definitely seen in the park over the years multiple versions of the mummy. Um, sometimes Brendan Fraser version, sometimes not. Well, they had that um, mummy. They had that mummy maze, which it, then House of Horrors took over. Well, there's the mummy roller coaster too. So there's usually well, yeah. somebody hanging out over there. There's also a Dracula that's a face character. Uh, for those of you not on the theme park lingo, a face character is. You know, like one of the mascots, but you can see their face. It's like an actual person. He, Yeah, he does have makeup on, but it's Dracula. So he's a bit more rare because you can see his face and they have to do makeup on him and stuff like that. It's a little more time consuming, right? Frankenstein, they just put a suit on a guy. Uh, but the suit has evolved over the years. Um, I talked about how Don Post had um, originally used Glenn Strange for their most famous Frankenstein mask. Uh, so for a while, they were using the Don Post mask uh, as Frankenstein. Um, so it was clearly not Boris Karloff, uh, which is weird because they went out of their way to get Lon Chaney Phantom. And this is um, Universal, so Phantom. they have the rights and, to. Right, right. They have the rights to everything. But yeah. uh, eventually they'd get a more Karloff mask, and then they would move through the years to a little more generic, non-actory Frankenstein um, yeah. but what's super interesting that I found out, okay, I got three fun facts for people. Fun fact, fun fact. Number one for this entry is that, uh, originally, uh, this character debuted around the sixties. Uh, he actually wore a screen used Herman Munster outfit from the neck down in a Don post mask. So somebody bought the costume in an auction and then they found out, holy shit, this is Herman Munster's costume and it's screen used. Um, the shoes weren't either because Fred Gwynn probably had giant feet. And if you have a normal person in a Frankenstein outfit, maybe not. Cause, cause Frankenstein has platforms about like, I don't know, eight, nine inches tall. And he's barely taller than me in a lot of pictures. And I'm six, four. So, um, they tend not to have super tall people as Frankenstein. Uh, second fun fact is they created Zach. I know you've seen the pictures I've posted. <laughs> <laughs> baby Frankenstein. Okay. They couldn't call him Frankenstein Jr. because of the Hanna Barbera cartoon. So they called him Baby Frankenstein the, despite him clearly being like a like a kid. I, I came it's across about, a baby Frankenstein film that I almost watched, but I did not get to it. <laughs> this kid's about eight or nine years old, probably. Uh he's a cartoony, fun, happy Frankenstein mascot that they would have uh go around the park. Um also, Universal in the late 70s had a makeup show in the Castle Theater. It was built, it was built for this show um, that was like a Castle Dracula makeup exhibit, and all the Universal monsters were in it. Uh, so there, there eventually became two Frankensteins in the park. The one in the makeup show that was makeup based, and the one that was mass based that was the walk-around character. And so to spice up the walk around character, they gave him baby Frankenstein that lasted until about like 
the early 80s. He was not around by 86 when I went for the first time. The other fun fact. So we have baby Frankenstein. We have a little bit of the origins of the character and how Herman Munster's clothes were being worn by this. I saw a very special Frankenstein when I went in the 80s because, you know, it was the mid 80s. What was popular? Break dancing. They had dancing Frankie and that's what they <laughs> called him. And so they, there was just a space where people would crowd around and watch this dude in the Frankenstein costume break dance. And it was wow. amazing. Like he was good. He is good. He wasn't doing like head spins or anything like that, but you know. Well, there was he, a monster in the Beetlejuice graveyard review as well, I believe. There was, there was. Um, and also they made a house of horrors maze uh, that had a very different angry looking Frankenstein that they oh, started yeah. using for a bit. Um, the Frankenstein they're using now is pretty similar to the one that they've been using since like the 90s. Uh, he's got a pretty nondescript face. He's very dark green. He has a mullet. And uh, yeah, he, you know, I'll I'll post a picture to our account or something of me with the latest one. Because I, I do have one um, from like the last five years and it hasn't changed since then. Um, but yeah, they used to, they used to be like a tag team though. You'd have Frankenstein and you'd have the Phantom, Lon Chaney Phantom. And the reason I say wrestling and I say tag team is because I have found pictures of Andre the Giant hanging out with both of them, which um, our official account needs to post up to because uh, they're pretty, they're pretty great. Um, I think it was when Andre was on, uh, he was at the park for a publicity thing people are saying, but they also filmed the $6 million man stuff there when he was the Bigfoot. So maybe it was both. Uh, but yeah, check these out. Look up old images, search for Frankenstein, walk around Universal Studios. You'll be fascinated by some of the history. I was, uh, and I've been tracking it since the mid 80s. So uh, there was like another 20 years on top of that that wasn't part of my life, but it, it's all it's all fun. And a lot of people... A lot of happy people getting pictures with Frankenstein because you see Frankenstein, you smile unless you're a punk bitch yeah. and you get scared. I definitely, I definitely have memories of seeing the, the monster at Universal Studios Hollywood, especially when they used to have the Universal Studios monster store because I think they had a store in the park and then they had the monster store at CityWalk, which is awesome. And of course, they, they closed it down because dumb reasons. Well, they <laughs> also had a Frankenstein um, quick service little cafeteria thing in the park for quite some time. Oh, yeah, I think I remember that. Yeah, so that's yeah. another one of those things. I think that was one of my earliest memories of seeing the monster. There is there is the Frankenstein parking garage still. Yeah, and they still have a, like a, like a, a cafe in like Florida where you can like have like dinners with like the maybe oh, not right yeah. now with like the monsters and stuff there. Like, yeah, every monster and... has like a room. Yeah, it's really cool. All right, so that was uh, Casey's first pick, right? Yeah, anything else you want to add? No, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. I, that, that's <laughs> so Frankenstein everything. at Universal Studios. Okay, so I kind of, as I said, I took a journey. I watched some weird, weird stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of fell into finding, I, you know, I went on IMDb and just looked at anything I could find. And I went on Letterboxd and just looked at the, like the most obscure things I could find. And I found some interesting made-for-TV Frankenstein films. Quite a few of those, yeah. There was one I was trying to dig up that there was one that Chris Sarandon played the monster, and I was like, I have to see this, but I just could not find it. Unfortunately, it was like a. Have you seen the one little... where? Uh, have you seen the one where Susan Sarandon plays the monster? <laughs> no, <laughs> but now I'm sad that you're probably making that up, and it's not does not exist. Oh, I'm absolutely making that up. Yeah. So this one came out in 1991. It's called Frankenstein: The College Years. Yeah. Directed by Tom Shadiak, who did The Nutty Professor, Ace Ventura, Pet Detective, Liar Liar, Bruce Almighty, Evan Almighty. So he's got quite the uh, quite the credit list. I have a feeling, Zach. Did you unturn this in your research that this might have been a failed pilot? It's not a pilot. It is. I mean, like, uh, I mean, it's, it's a 90 minute. It was on Fox Network TV. Movies. Well, yeah, but they would do 90 minute movies to... They don't really like set up anything pilot. as a pilot. I mean, it's okay. like it feels like a self-contained story. Okay, okay. But I watched this because on IMDb, the headlining, the first like user review that's there is "Think Frankenstein meets Encino Man." 
And I said to myself, I have to watch this for Casey. This is this is not Frankenstein meets Encino Man. That offends me. <laughs> you haven't even seen it, man. <laughs> no, I I have watched this, but I have not watched this since 1990 or whenever it came out. <laughs> okay, yeah, it came out in 91. Okay, so it stars William Ragsdale, so Fright Night. So it's, yeah. it's got a good cast. Also, Christopher Daniel Barnes, who you'll know from the Brady Bunch parody films. He was Greg Brady. Oh, okay, okay. So they're like the Polly Shore and Sean Astin of this film. <laughs> Casey, That's enough right there. <laughs> William Ragsdale is great. Come on. So they're two college students. So the film opens with the student, uh, a student giving a presentation, and their professor, Professor Lipsiger, just like drops dead while he's presenting this really boring presentation. <laughs> like he's just like passed out, passes out on his desk, and one of the students checks on him and he's like, he's dead. <laughs> You know, when I saw this as a kid, I thought this was what college would be like. And I was right. (laughs) So they hold a funeral for the professor. And then right after this funeral, they throw a rager of a party, these students. Mm -hmm. And they hoist this, the professor up on like this table, like weekend at Bernie style with sunglasses. (laughs) They like pay their respects to him while they're just partying because he, he died. Even though one of the body. (laughs) And one of the students, the nerdy guy that, like, I guess, who was giving the presentation that caused him to die, I guess, is like, isn't that the professor? And Ragsdale's like, what I put him up there, that's just a wax sculpture. What I hoist up the professor there on that table? Come on. Um, so Ragsdale, though, was actually his assistant and good friends of them. And the professor, Professor Lipsiger, has uh, gave him his key card and his passing to his like, laboratory. So... Mark, who is Ragsdale's character, and Jay, who is a Christopher Daniel Barnes, they go to this laboratory and they discover Frankenstein's monster there. And I gotta say, the monster in this movie is like the Fabio of Frankenstein monsters. Another one you should look up. He has like flowing long hair. Looks a little similar to the monster in the Monster Squad, but not as good. But he has like flowing locks. It's like if you this told is, me this is when Universal was the height of suing people for stealing their Frankenstein. So this, is when they were, this is when they were trying to make him cool. If you told me Fabio played this monster, I would I would have believed? Honestly, you. I, I I think it just looks like um, the dude from. Um, um you know young frankenstein i think it, it looks too much like peter young frankenstein boyle? To me. yeah if i'm if i'm not mistaken uh, but it looks like peter boyle is a regular person uh but is am i mistaken is this carol struck in as the frankenstein monster no it is vincent hammond okay okay played, yeah, he cause... played the, he played the monster in the relic uh he was also in a bunch of other things i think he was in like a star trek episode species two i think i saw on his his credit list because yeah, facially he kind of looks like the dude who played lurch in the uh, he looks a little lurch yeah. movies yeah so the antagonist of this film is larry miller if you were uh, if you grew up in the late 90s early 2000s this guy was like in everything he was like the uh, you know he was the angry dad and 10 things i hate about you kind of just that menacing stare and very kind of short not sh- like short kind of one note responses and <laughs> he he played this this uh, archetype well and so he is uh, like a rival kind of staff member and he kind of wants to get access to Lipsiger's research and profit from it and so he's after these guys the whole time it's a lot of shenanigans i think Christopher Daniel Barnes character he he works for the football team where he's on the football team and Frankenstein's monster shows up to one of the practices after they revive him and like throws a football. And of course the coach wants to get him on the team. There aren't any, there isn't any footage of like in-game stuff, but there is this stuff from practice. There's, you know, I, I, you know, a close montage sequence where they have to dress him up because they realize they have to take him across campus. So he's trying on different outfits and, you know, funny. (laughs) Yeah. I think that was like half the commercial. If I remember correctly, (laughs) this this was very heavily promoted. Yeah. It's, it's not bad. It's just there, there isn't like a ton to it. There's a sequence where Christopher, uh, Daniel Barnes character is dating a girl and her friend thinks Frankenstein's monster is cute. So they go on a double date and some guys try and bother them and Frankenstein kind of, you know, throws uh, them through a window. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so yeah. It's it's a cute made for TV Fox film. I mean, they have to enroll them in the, the college at one point and they use the very clever name Frank and Stein. Uh, <laughs> hey, Madman had Frank Einstein uh, and a lot of people didn't pick up on it, uh, which is I won't funny. I won't spoil the whole thing. It is uh, was uploaded to YouTube. It's it's. It's not like the best quality, but you can get by with it. If you're just looking for something, just like an oddity from the early 90s, 
this is totally totally harmless. It's it's did, it have, did the version you watch have commercials on it? No, no commercials. Damn, though. I yeah. I would love to see it with the commercials. Yeah, no commercials. Oh. But yeah, William Ragsdale is is fantastic. Always great to see him. Yeah, so I definitely I definitely recommend uh, checking it out. Frankenstein: The College Years, just another oddity. And the next item on my list is even stranger. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, it's not your turn, bitch. <laughs> All right. Uh, no, um, yeah. Okay. So I feel like I got to go weird. Uh, comics are going to be, um, uh, kind of my, my main event. How about that? Comic comics are works for me. Um, uh, because comics are going to have the most stuff to talk about. Okay. So, um, what I'd like to talk about with you today is, um, okay. We're going to talk N64, Zach. Okay. Did you oh, ever yeah. have, a, you had an N64, right? Uh, or was that a little yeah. before your time? Okay. No, I had I, I had a Super Nintendo, man. Oh, okay, okay. So um, Nintendo sixty four, which I, I I've heard that this game is the second, or first or second highest selling third party game in the system history. So if you didn't have it, someone you know had it, okay? Because it was that big of a se- uh, a seller. Uh, I'm talking about. The wrestling game WCW NWO Revenge. Okay, I did not know where you were going with that. I was like, I do not remember any best-selling Frankenstein video games in '64. <laughs> what's great is I told you what I was covering, and you still didn't know. Uh, so, <laughs> so <laughs> did you play? Were Were you someone that played these wrestling games growing up? I mean, they're I did. They're, I did. Oh, come on, they're this. fantastic. I have more memories of No Mercy, but I did have the WCW game. Yeah, so basically what happened is they made um they made 6 of them for the um Nintendo 64. Um they made Virtual Pro Wrestling 64 in Japan. Uh and then that kind of got translated into um oh, well actually I think WCW NWO World Tour was first because there were a couple of extra things in Virtual Pro Wrestling. Um but they came out around the same time. They were kind of like sister titles. Then they did uh, WCW NWO Revenge. Yeah. Uh, then WWF bought the license, and they had um, they were not WWE yet. I I distinguish. Um, so you got WWF WrestleMania 2000, and you got WWF No Mercy using that same engine, um, the Aki engine um, from THQ publishing Aki, like some of the best wrestling games ever. And then you got the Japanese game. Um, Virtual Pro Wrestling 2, which is amazing, carried an all Japan license. Uh, actually, more Japanese based, uh, had this character in the game, but as himself. Uh, so, so what they did uh, with these WCW games is they would have WCW wrestlers and then they would have a whole bunch of promotions of fake wrestlers. And don't don't make jokes about fake wrestlers. Fuck off. I mean, like, not based on actual people. Uh, okay, so uh, they had uh, they had like three groups in this game, and they actually were based on real people, but a lot of people didn't know it back then. Uh, so there was this legendary, legendary Japanese wrestler named Jumbo Saruta. Okay, trained by Terry Funk. Big, big dude. Um, one of the greatest all Japan champions of all time, tremendous wrestler, kind of the guy that put, went out of his way to put Mitsuharu Misawa over so that Misawa, Misawa, uh, could become the next top guy in all Japan and kind of like make history and all that. Okay. So, uh, Jumbo, absolute legend. And usually when you fight him in wrestling games, he's a fucking monster because he's a top guy in Japan. So he's got like super high stats, you know? And, like, his moves are super strong. Like, even in the Fire Pro games, he's like a monster. He'll destroy you. Okay. Um, So, I guess somebody looked at him and they're like, Jumbo Saruta, monster. Monster. What can I do? And so, they're like, we're going to turn this motherfucker into Frankenstein. (laughs) And so, WCW NWO Revenge has one of the best characters. How do you spell his name? Um, Dr. Frank. D R period F R A N K. No, um, Jumbo Saruta is Jumbo. Oh, and I see him. I see him. I see him. Okay. Like biker Frankenstein. T 
Do you look, do you see Jumbo Saruta yet though? That's T S. Uh, I see Jumbo. I see a I see a picture of Jumbo Saruta. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, I, I'm pretty sure I spelled Saruta right. Just said. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, most of the stuff I play with him in it, his name's written in Japanese. But uh, okay, so Jumbo. Yeah, this, guy, this guy was huge. Yeah, he's a pretty big dude. That's why they call him Jumbo. They're not gonna. It's not an ironic Jumbo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know if they call him tiny saruta that would be that would be very ironic uh yeah but dr frank is the shit so okay he's got a frankenstein head and he's got the bolts on his neck which is a little legal issues possibly uh he has uh, a mohawk kind of instead of a flat top and um he wears uh, yeah, this it's hard to make out but you can see it yeah, he wears this sick biker jacket that has a flaming skull on the back of it and uh, and leather pants. You know, he walks to the ring. I'm pretty sure they gave him the over the top rope ring entrance where you like put your foot over the top rope like a giant. And uh, this dude was just a badass. Like uh, they gave him uh, his finishing move in the game, though, is the giant swing, which uh, I mean, that fits for Frankenstein. It doesn't fit for Jumbo Saruta, really, though. He's used it a, a couple times, but... Was this like I an alternate attire for Jumbo Saruta, or was it just a different no, character? No, they gave... They tweaked Jumbo Saruta's moveset a little bit, and then they made a Frankenstein character. Okay, well, it's not supposed to be Jumbo Saruta, then. Yeah, but it is, but it's not. <laughs> it's complicated. So, so, like, for example, they would get... Uh, Dr. Death Steve Williams, they give him a different head and face and they'd call him Jekyll. Okay. So there's a guy called Jekyll in there too. And there's a guy named Dr. Frank. Pretty awesome. Um, but hey, see, how uh, have you never donned the Dr. Frank outfit for Halloween? Like, how have you not done that? I can't find a mask that looks enough like him. And I don't have a leather jacket with a flaming skull Just on the get, back. Get like course. a makeup, man. Go to Cinema Secrets. Get a Witchy Witchy FX uh, set. You know what the real thing is, Zach? I hate having to explain the costume. <laughs> People would be like, oh, hey, it's Frankenstein. Well, actually, I'm Dr. Frank, you dumb motherfucker. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do Just that. say you're rock and roll. I mean, that's something else. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a completely different movie. Uh, uh, if, you've, if you've seen rock and roll Frankenstein, uh, yeah. Yeah. That's not five good. stars. You've seen that movie? I've seen rock and roll Frankenstein. Oh, my God. I almost talked about that film. It is this is your this is your pick so maybe i'll touch on that later that movie is something wow it's, it's great um so uh incredibly homophobic but yeah yeah it's not great in hindsight um but <laughs> are we just gonna keep going on this tangent because i can at least no, talk about no. the setup of, doc, of rock and roll no. frankenstein <laughs> no because people have come to hear about nintendo 64 games um so hey if you if you really want to see Dr. Frank and if you if you've never seen Dr. Frank you'll want to go on YouTube look up Dr. Frank Revenge uh you'll get you'll get some shots of him coming to the ring you'll get some shots of him doing the giant swing um my favorite character in the game by far um that isn't Aki man cuz he was like the best character come on um and there is Dr. Frank merch I own a Dr. Frank t-shirt uh that someone did nice. it, it looks awesome um it's actually by this company called spirit gauge i was just blanking on the name for a second there um and it looks like a misfit shirt kind of uh it's got dr frank and he's like flexing it, the, the only colors are green and purple uh it looks like it looks like a horror punk band shirt um but it's for this obscure video game and it's one of those things if you wear it and someone actually recognizes it you're like it's a real G right there. That's a real G right there. But um, yeah, I I implore you to emulate this game. The rights are fucked. You're never going to get to play this game legally. So go ahead and emulate it and uh, play as Dr. Frank. Win the title. Go for it, dude. If you look, man, there's video games and then there's video games where you can fight the Macho Man with fucking Frankenstein. OK, <laughs> and that's some next level shit right there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Zach, what do you got? Oh, gosh. I love this episode. Okay. <laughs> oh, man. See, I feel like I should talk about Rock and Roll Frankenstein, but uh, I really don't want to. But like. No, I don't. Don't. We'll do it. We'll do a full episode. 
Oh, gosh, no. I, I'll get to Rock and Roll Frankenstein at the end of the show. I will just tell you what the movie is about, the setup. And and just just to, just so I don't not tease you guys and not deliver for those of you that have not seen that movie, because, yeah. So, but uh, what I'm going to talk about is also pretty interesting. So, again, I, I went on a crazy ride here watching all these Frankenstein adaptations, just trying to find the weirdest, obscurest crap. Not necessarily bad stuff, just weird. And I found another oddity. It's a direct-to-video film, I believe, called Billy Frankenstein. This came out in 1998. It's directed by Fred Olin Ray. And I gotta say, this guy has the craziest list of IMDb credits I have ever seen. It's like a mile long. He has like 159 credits. He started off doing like low-budget 80s, you know, like horror B movies, action films. Uh, trust me, trust me, Zach. Our listeners should know who Fred Olin Ray is. He's a fucking legend. Yeah. Okay. This guy started off doing low budget, like B horror movies. Man did movies. Hollywood chainsaw hookers, bro. Come yeah. On. So after that, in the kind of early 2000s, he uh, moved to soft core porn. And now, and now he's doing like made for TV holiday films. Yeah. Stuff about snipers. Yeah. Yeah, so that's just quite the career. <laughs> but you can find Billy Frankenstein on a streaming service called Plex. It was actually on YouTube. Like someone uploaded it this week and have, they've since terminated their account. I guess, no. they were, I guess they were just, they could not, they, they were ashamed of what they uploaded to the internet. Uh, this movie isn't that bad. It's just really strange. But you can find it on a platform called Plex. Very completely legal to watch there. So in between all that in the 90s, uh, Fred Olin Ray made Billy Frick side. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay, so you know, in like a movie or like a bad TV show when, you know, as a, as a writer, sometimes you might have like an aside where a character says something to themselves. If you do that, you want to use it sparingly, like one, like a brief line or something like not at all. This movie is like 75% soliloquy mm -hmm. where characters are like talking to themselves. I will give you an example line for line in this movie, word for word. There was one point where a mom or the mom character in this film wakes up and she goes, I think I'll make Billy his favorite breakfast this morning. Sausage and pancakes. Maybe that'll take his mind off his dad. Speaking of George, I wonder how he's coping without us. And then you cut to a scene with the dad. This movie is like 75%. Uh, a, lot, a lot of B movies from this era did that. But this was like more like an exaggerated than I've ever seen before. It's actually pretty great. So let me get to the setup of this film. So it's called Billy Frankenstein. It's about a family, a mom, a dad. The dad is played by Darren Norris, who, if you've seen the Fairly Odd Parents, he voices like half the characters on that show. He was also the janitor in Ned's Declassified School Survival Guide. Very kind of cartoony uh, actor, but really, uh, really entertaining. He, he, his part is kind of more of a bit part in this, but he, he, he's certainly a featured character. So he is an ascendant of Frankenstein. So Frankenstein, this movie starts off, Frankenstein is dead. There's like a funeral some woman is like weeping over his casket and we see the caretaker of Frankenstein's estate, Frankenstein castle, a guy named bloodstone. So Stolen from Marvel comics. <laughs> so Frankenstein's castle is, uh, kind of nestled in, I guess, Frankenstein village. And the village, I guess, is kind of in disarray since the monster hasn't appeared in a long time. And now that Frankenstein's dead, the, the village is sort of not in a, a bad state. Okay. This movie, so yeah. <laughs> Frankenstein village. Yes. When the villagers are the ones who tried to kill Frankenstein. <laughs> not not in this movie, not in this theater. Okay. Okay. Frankenstein Village is like a tourist destination. There's a shot of okay. like a marketplace. So uh, it's like can, Santa's village? This marketplace, I'm gonna I'm not exaggerating, might be like five feet long. It's like the narrowest freaking like alley that you've seen, and there's like vendors set up. And there's this woman that's selling like Frankenstein dolls and someone else selling human brains. <laughs> um like a woman is walking with her daughter and she picks up a doll and she wants to buy the doll. And their mom is like monsters. You believe in monsters. You think if monsters existed, we would, we would, we would be living like this. And she was like monsters. Now you're going to believe in Santa Claus next. So they're setting up a really odd universe <laughs> that I yeah. still don't quite understand. Anyway, Frankenstein has passed, but they discover this descendant and this family is living under the last name Frank. The dad has not told him that his last name is really Frankenstein because he's trying to hide that past of his. <laughs> so they find out that they are sent, that, that they've inherited Frankenstein's castle, and the uh, caretaker of the place is hoping that they can restore the name of Frankenstein and resurrect the monster. He's actually not the bad guy. 
Uh, so uh, the mom and the son and the mom's sister go to this castle because the dad is busy working. And that's kind of a through line in this film is that the dad is too busy working to spend time with his family. But they inherit this castle. And, oh, this movie, man. Uh, <laughs> the villain in this film is played by... I am stalling so I can find his name. Casey, say something. Uh, Vernon Hi. Wells. Vernon Wells. <laughs> so if you know Vernon Wells, he was in Commando. He was in Mad Max 2. Mm -hmm. So the he plays... Warrior. Yeah. No one plays, calls him Mad Max 2. <laughs> he plays a generic kind of real estate mogul. He's the richest man in Frankenstein Village. And Victor Frankenstein would never sell his castle to him. So he wants to you know, scare off this family so he can kind of demolish this castle and build a shopping mall in Frankenstein village. So his sidekick is this constable in town, like the police force there, this German constable who's basically a Nazi, but they don't call him a Nazi and his family lineage. Like there, he has like pictures up on this, like his, his, you know why his, they yeah. wanted to sell the movie to Germany is why <laughs> he has pictures up on the wall, framed pictures of like his relatives that have, they've all captured the monster. And I don't know if this is the same monster that's in the movie, but they've all captured this monster. And he has a picture of himself with nothing. And he has not captured the monster. And it's like his life's goal to capture this monster. He's a very over the top German accent. <laughs> there's a, th there's a scene where you see Vernon interact with the, the, the constable here. And his last name is frog, or as he says, frog, but it's spelled frog. And Vernon calls him frog. <laughs> of course. It's a high to comedy. <laughs> so there's a there's an exchange where Vernon is like, he comes to, to meet the constable and he's like, I carry a very big stick in this town. And Vernon has like a German, uh, like a like a, a sidekick, a female that, who just follows him around. And she goes, you know, I hate your big stick. I like little itty bitty stick like kind air frog has. And she points to a stick that's on the wall. And it's like a wooden stick. And there is a little plaque above it that says, Air Frog's little itty bitty stick. This is supposed to be for kids. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, well, that's why they they pointed to the stick. And I, I, made I, feel it very like, obvious. I feel like yeah. the writer was trying to make himself feel better about something, but I'm that that's uh, that's just my commentary. Uh, <laughs> hey, it depends. If Fred Owen Ray wrote it, that guy probably has a gigantic dick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. We get back to the family. They, the boy Billy, he finds Frankenstein's diary. Mm -hmm. So we get we get more of this soliloquy. My favorites are from Bloodstone, who like any. So the boy finds this journal, and then Bloodstone, like he goes up the stairs, and then Blood it cuts to like pants to Bloodstone, who like sticks his head through like an iron gate. And he goes, "The boy is quick. That old journal should make for some very inspired reading." <laughs> So it has scenes like this. There's a dinner scene like five minutes later where the mom is like, can we just bring some peace to this place? And Billy goes, peaceful is boring. I think we should bring some life to this place. And then Bloodstone appears out of, out of a corridor while this family is eating dinner. They do not hear him say this. And he goes, and you shall, my boy, and you shall. No oh, response. <laughs> no response. It's like every movie I fucking watched on cable growing he, up. He's not whispering this. There's no reason like this family should not have heard him say that. But you know, anyway, he's not the bad guy. He's really not. So they resurrect this monster. Who they probably could have, sh should have been sued for. Um, yeah, you should look up the monster in this because he, uh, has like, yeah. he has like a megalithic forehead. He has the flattest top I've ever seen on a Frankenstein monster. He's supposed to have a flat top, but you could land a plane on this thing. He looks he, exactly like the universal Frankenstein, except the bolts are on his forehead. He, he, has, he has quite the mullet. Mm -hmm. And his eyes are practically closed. They're like very droopy, like very puffy. Try to be Karloff. Yeah. Let me get you to my favorite scene in this movie. Because this film does something that not any other Frankenstein adaptation that I'm aware of does. It answers the question, does Frankenstein poop? Shit, that's a good question. <laughs> and the answer is yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> there Dude, is a scene. Wow, you know how much plumbing that would take from <laughs> Dr. Frankenstein? Like, you'd have to get all of these intestines from different bodies and sew them together and still make it that this guy could shit? 
you think this is something that Troma would have answered. They may have, and I'm unaware of it. No, no, they didn't really do Frankenstein. They've distributed a um, Dracula versus Frankenstein. So, so the boy resurrects the monster. I will say the monster, it was an interesting bit of IMDb trivia. So the monster, this was originally offered to David Prose, who was uh, Vader, who was Darth Vader. Yeah. He declined due to health problems. So the part went to Brian Carrillo, who played the monster on stage during a four-year run at Beetlejuice's Graveyard Review. So, right, right. So, um, He's fine as the monster. He's pretty funny. So my favorite scene in this, the monster escapes and he runs into a blind monk. So this is a nod to Bride of Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. The monk is played by Tommy Kirk, who was in a lot of Disney projects as a kid, including Swiss Family Robinson. So he doesn't know who's uh, this intruder. He initially like bats Frankenstein with a stick. This is very much played for laughs. And there's a scene where he, he like points to some grapes and he's like, oh, aren't these oh, grapes? Oh, you mean the real Swiss Family Robinson? Yeah, the like real the, Swiss yeah, Family Yeah, wow, OG. okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, there's, so Frankenstein Monster like stumbles into his like chateau and he points to some grapes and he's like, oh, these grapes, they're, aren't, these, aren't they delectable? Aren't they delicious? And Frankenstein's like, oh, and he, he takes a, a grape and he starts to eat it. <laughs> and Tommy Kirk goes, oh, but not these grapes. They're, they're super sour. I never could grow really sweet grapes here. <laughs> so, so Frankenstein monster spits him out and then he goes, you know what you need? You need a nice cup of water. And he hands Frankenstein a water from like this little pond and Frankenstein starts to drink it. And Tommy Kirk goes, but not that water. It's bad. A few animals died in it, never found their bodies. And the last time I drank from it, I had the run so bad. I had to sit in a toilet for almost a week. <laughs> Frankenstein's monster just does a spit take. <laughs> He's like, He's like, yeah, no one ever reads the sign. And there's like a sign that's like poison water. Don't drink this. <laughs> but he hands he hands the monster some toilet paper. He's like, that's why I always keep this on hand because no one reads the sign. So Frankenstein monster runs out clutching his ass and holding toilet paper. Okay, so he has to. So Frankenstein not only shits, he he diarrheas. Um, yeah, we, we didn't get to see. We don't get to see that, unfortunately. Um, the next time we see him, he's like sitting on some stones. Um, <laughs> God damn it, Fred. <laughs> so that's basically this movie i'm not going to spoil the whole ending i just went over some of my favorite scenes from this it is ridiculous it's i i kind of want to recommend watching it just because it's so silly but there are a lot of long laggy scenes and the kind of constant asides and soliloquies get a little old but if you want like a really strange oddity if this came out in 1998 go ahead and check out billy frankenstein the only uh, frankenstein adaptation that answers the question does frankenstein poop so, uh, all right, Casey, what else do you, what do you, what else do you have for us? <laughs> okay. So ladies and gentlemen, this is your main event of my picks and it's Frankenstein and comics because there are two things that I really love in life, Frankenstein and comics. Um, he's had a pretty dope history in comics. Uh, if you think about it, I, I just want to highlight some of the best things and I want to highlight a, a really weird one. And I also want to highlight one that I just randomly picked up yesterday. Nice. Nice. Not knowing what it was. And I, and I, and I like it. And now that I've read some of it, um, so, uh, first, first and foremost, I want to highlight Bernie Wrightson's Frankenstein. Um, it's a big, giant, giant book uh, full of amazing artwork. And it's an adaptation of the original uh, Mary Shelley story, um, but with extensive art by Bernie Wrightson. Do oh, yourself yeah. a favor. That's Google that's, this. That's, that's gorgeous. Yeah. I have I have prints of this on my wall. Okay. Um, this is just the best horror artist that ever lived, Bernie Wrightson, in my opinion. Uh, just absolutely fucking murdering it in this Frankenstein book. There, there's one thing I want to tell you though. There is a sequel called Frankenstein Alive, Alive. Um, I would avoid that. Yes, it has Bernie Wrightson's art, but he passed away during the completion of it, so some of it's completed by someone else. And I don't think it's a good way for Bernie to go out. I think that if you if you really want to see him do Frankenstein. Go for the original book. It's amazing. Um, Nakatomi Inc. sells prints of it that are just beautiful. I have one on my wall of the of the lab scene that has the monster kind of like 
rattling the doctor by his collar and shaking him around. <laughs> and uh, but the detail on the lab and all of the bottles and all of the equipment is just amazing. Uh, some of the most detailed work you will ever see in the comic medium. And it's just great. Um, if you're unfamiliar with Bernie Wrightson, he did the art for creep show. Okay. So if you've seen the creep show movies, you've seen his stuff. If you've read Stephen King's cycle of the werewolf, he does the art in that as well. Uh, you know, that silver bullet was based on, um, the guy's a legend and, uh, rightfully so he's considered this. He always considered this like his masterpiece. And if you look at it, it definitely shows. Okay, my second choice is going from my favorite horror artist of all time, who is unfortunately no longer with us, Bernie Wrightson. I want to go to my favorite horror artist now, um, who is Junji Ito. Uh, Junji Ito did a Frankenstein oh, uh, shit, did adaptation he? as well. Yes, um, it's Frankenstein and other works. Uh, so he does a fairly faithful recreation of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, but with Junji Ito's artwork, which is creepy as shit. Yeah, his uh, stuff is, is terrifying. Yeah, I I, I honestly oh, wow. do think yeah. he is the best living horror comics artist right now. Uh, I know a lot of people listening might not be into anime or manga, but the, yeah, this is manga. It's Japanese comics. It's worth checking out. Broaden your horizons. Jinji Ito's work's amazing. If you like horror, you will love his stuff. Yeah, for those uh, of you very that, think, unsettling. that think Frankenstein's monster can't be scary, uh, check out this artwork. It's uh, it's it's frightening, and I'd love to see like a live action adaptation of his his Frankenstein monster. Yeah, I would. Uh, I would too. Uh, he does have an anime series that is adaptations of his work. It hasn't done this. Um, there have been live action adaptations of a couple of his better known uh, horror creations. Uh, Uzumaki and Tomi have had live action movies. Uh, I would say check out the manga though, or the anime based on his artwork. Cause if you're, lo if you're watching live action, you're losing his artwork, which is a key element to it. Yeah. Um, in my opinion, um, I think like if they did a live action version of this Frankenstein, it would just be a boring one of the mill Frankenstein movie, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, but if they got the look of the stuff, it would kind of be cool. Uh, so I'd like to highlight a couple oddities though. Um, one of them is one that I just picked up yesterday uh, because I saw it randomly at the comic store when I was uh, picking up the new um, Morbius trade paperback that collects like his early appearances from the seventies. Uh, Cause I love horror comics and um, it's called doc Frankenstein. And I knew nothing about this when I picked it up. It looked vaguely familiar and it turns out it was written by the Wachowskis and I'm like, okay, I kind of remember this. And so he just picked this up like yesterday. Cause that yeah. he showed me a picture of it. It looks awesome. Yeah, and it is pretty awesome. It's done by the Wachowskis, and they had done it a long time ago, and the series kind of died. So they went back and finished it, and this book is like the whole series finished. Um, the, you know, Lana Wachowski writes this whole letter saying, you know, we went through a lot writing this. We went from being the Wachowski brothers to the Wachowski sisters. We um, And basically said, if you have a problem with that, fuck off, which is awesome. And uh, we also made all of these movies that kind of took our time away from the comics. And in going through life stuff and in going through movie stuff, we've always wanted to go back, but never have been able to. But now we can and we can finish it off. Um, Doc Frankenstein is kind of like a superhero, but people are still trying to kill him. There's like this holy army, like think G.I. Joe, but like from the Vatican that's yeah, trying to destroy yeah. him. Like they have like jets and shit. And um, they're going after him in modern times. So basically, it leaves off where Frankenstein's in the Arctic that a lot of the stories uh, finish off in. And he manages to like fight a Yeti and fucking murder him. And then he's like, oh, I should fight monsters. And so he does. And it's stories from different time periods, though. So you see a lot of like modern stuff at first, but then it goes into Old West Frankenstein stuff. Yeah. Where he's fighting werewolves, and it's awesome. Oh, that's cool. Uh, yeah. So it's Frankenstein fighting werewolves in the Old West. It's amazing. 
uh yeah i really recommend this book it's pretty cool it's a nice hardcover it's 35 bucks uh collects everything amazing artwork sometimes the artists change but it's it's pretty good stuff uh jeff darrow kind of helped create this character uh i'm not sure how much of the art is his um but he's always been one of my favorite artists if you've seen uh big guy and rusty the boy robot uh that's his stuff um but yeah this one this one was pretty good for something i picked up yesterday i was pretty excited to share it with you guys because i'm like yeah this kind of rocks um i'm looking forward to reading the whole thing i didn't have time to do it because literally i picked this up like maybe 12 hours ago or well like 16 hours ago something like that and uh yeah that's pretty good um I talked about collecting Marvel stuff too, and I really want to touch on Monster of Frankenstein from Marvel. It's not a good book, <laughs> but it's a fun book. Uh, the reason for it is it's got a really weird setup. So it kind of starts retelling the story of Mary Shelley. A lot of these start with retelling Mary Shelley. Okay. But the difference here is that Frankenstein exists in the Marvel universe. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But so does Mary Shelley's book. So people will read the book and be like, Oh yeah, I read the book Frankenstein. It's a nice book. You know, there's movies and all kinds of shit. Right. But then there's a real Frankenstein also. So it was like based on a true story mm -hmm. and no one knew. But also when I say Frankenstein, exists in the marvel universe he's interacting with established marvel heroes fighting them sometimes shield goes after him there's all this stuff which it's like okay if they wanted to put frankenstein in the mcu they could okay so you remember blast from the past like their old location in burbank yes yeah so how they had star wars and how they had spider-man and how they had Frankenstein on the side of the building, and it was just those three. Mm -hmm. Legally, you can do that now. You could have that crossover. Marvel pub Marvel publishes or has published each of those three characters, and anyone can publish a Frankenstein story. He's public domain. You just can't make him look too much like the Universal one. Yeah. So yeah, interesting. Disney owns two of the three, and they can put Frankenstein in whatever they want. That could be a real crossover. Make it happen, cowards. So what you're saying is Frankenstein needs to join the MCU? Yeah, because he's already in the the regular Marvel Universe. So's Godzilla. The Godzilla Godzilla fought the thing, bro. Uh, the the thing, the superhero? Yeah. Yeah. But that's a lopsided fight. <laughs> in these uh in these comics, I'm pretty sure Frankenstein fights Thing or the Hulk. Uh, How is the thing gonna fight Godzilla, dude? The Godzilla could stomp on him. Very careful. Do the thing fought Galactus, bro. Come on. Okay, but like, that's not a. F How was that even? Uh, the, the Godzilla's like a was shield than like skyscrapers. Yeah, shield was helping. It was okay. <laughs> but yeah, uh, in fact, the the Marvel Godzilla comics <laughs> are all about Shield trying to stop Godzilla. Oh gosh. But yeah. Um, so yeah, check it out. If I had to recommend just one for you to see, though, it would be Bernie Wrightson's. Frankenstein. It stands out head and shoulders above the rest, and uh, I highly recommend it. It's a stand. See, you're not going to find it like in comic bins, probably, because it's a really big book. You might have to special order it, um, but it is worth it in every way. Do not buy it digitally. The art is meant to be seen in a large format. It's fucking beautiful. Um, buy some prints. Put it on your wall. Look classy. I've got some. Oh, man. All right, so before we close this out, I'm just going to I watched so much Frankenstein <laughs> over the last week or two. So I'm just going to talk briefly about a couple others that I came across. All right. So one, just briefly that I want to mention, because I think it's really interesting conceptually. I watched a movie called The Frankenstein Theory. This came out in 2013. It's a I hate this movie. You hate, you've seen it. I've seen it. It's a found footage take on the Frankenstein monster, which I think conceptually is an awesome idea. This execution, execution is not great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. it basically just becomes every other, you know, found footage flick about some monster in the snow. And uh, it really doesn't dig into the legend enough. It it has promise. It just doesn't deliver on it. But if you're, you know, it has like concept promise. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't abhor it as much as Casey apparently did. But if you're bored and you're just browsing through Tubi and you're just curious 
put it on the for 20 minutes like shit you don't really see him until the end <laughs> and even then you only yeah get but he's the he's the box art though so they're kind of you get a better it. glimpse on the box art like and if you just look up like a still of it you see what he looks like but you see more, you get better look of him there than you do in the movie it's like he's very much cloaked in shadow yeah, he looks like Robert De Niro's Frankenstein, which we're not talking a about. A little bit. He actually looks a little bit like the thing. <laughs> Since we brought him up. Yeah, but like the shitty movie thing that looks like he's made out of poop instead of rocks. Yeah. The Michael Chiklis yeah. one. Yeah. All right. I like Michael Chiklis. Perfect for the role. Right, that so... thing looked like shit. <laughs> anyway, let me touch on rock and roll Frankenstein. Since we brought it up, you have not seen this movie. Came out in 1999. One of the stupidest things I've ever seen. But the opening like 20 minutes of this Stupid movie, like a fox. One, the opening 20 minutes of this movie are pretty incredible. It just drops off a precipitous cliff like after that, like steep. So oh, I disagree. I feel like it gets better as it goes. Uh, I mean, if if you're really homophobic, I guess it gets better. No, I mean, you can you can turn that off. You can turn that off. You know, so, like uh, the setup of this movie. It's not curse of the queer wolf homo homophobic. Like that's the most homophobic. It's pretty bad. I, I turned it off at one point and then I decided to go back and finish it because I was just curious as to how it ended. So rock and roll Frankenstein is about this. You, know, you can't remember how it ended. <laughs> okay. I haven't seen this since like 1999. Okay? Oh gosh. Of course you saw it. When it yeah. came out. So this is like a pretty sure direct to video. Yeah, it was it was like Hollywood video it's about like a Hollywood executive. His like biggest musician musician artist client leaves him. So he decides he wants to build like the ultimate musician. His nephew is basically Victor Frankenstein, his young nephew. He has like mm -hmm. a laboratory and he likes to he used to like work for the coroner. He likes to reanimate body parts. And so his uncle or whatever wants him to wants to get together, uh, wants to find body parts from all the famous musicians the most famous musicians in the world, dead musicians to make one ultimate, uh, musician. Uh, so. Tell them about, tell them about the dick, Zach. So I should point out that the guy who plays Victor Frankenstein is like a necrophiliac and he's kind of supposed yeah. to be who you're like sympathetic for. for this movie. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he fucks dead people. Yeah. yeah. So he gets together. My favorite character in this movie is named Iggy. He's like a, you know, druggy hipsy, like roadie kind of, him and his friends go on this like road trip collecting body parts. There's like a cemetery just called Rock and Roll Cemetery where they get <laughs> like Sid Vicious's feet and I think his ass. They get yeah, yeah. They get Elvis's skull and I mean they're basically making Elvis. They get yeah. they get Jimi Hendrix hands. So this Frankenstein monster oh. has black hands, which wow. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> it was a different time, Zach. Yeah. So they're putting them together and the the executive is like, guys, guys, you're missing, you're missing his schlong, his thing, his thing, his penis. And mm -hmm. they're like, oh, mm -hmm. okay. And they're like, whose dick do we get? And he's like, Jim Morrison. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. sol solid, you know. And of course, the the uh, Victor Frankenstein knows that even though Jim Morrison is buried in France, his penis, there's a coroner that collects famous people's like schlongs, apparently dead people's yeah, schlongs yeah. and keeps them in jars. So they Where go. You? So Iggy and his buddies go to collect Jim Morrison's penis. And you see all these jars here. They this this coroner, this dude has Lassie's dick in a jar. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Lassie. <laughs> Girl dog. Um, <laughs> so they they grab Jim Morrison's dick and for whatever reason it like breaks and they pick it off on the ground and they accidentally put it in a vat of hydrochloric acid. <laughs> and they're like, oh shit, oh shit. So Iggy just grabs another dick off the the shelf and they leave and they end up grabbing Liberace's penis. Yes. So they make a gay Frankenstein. Yeah, so it's Elvis's head and his but his dick becomes like sentient and is gay. Mm -hmm. and Elvis pretty much they start a band called Unnatural Urges so you can see why this is super like homophobic yeah look like we can't all be a celebration of gay Frankenstein like Frankenberry is so the movie is basically him trying to hook up with people and his dick wanting to mess with dudes there's a there's like a mm -hmm. subplot where he's collecting like gerbils and putting them in like condoms and shoving them up his ass I mean like it's really, yeah, it's a little weird it's weird mm -hmm. it's weird he, you know, he, he like pretty much rapes and kills a bunch of chicks. He shoves, uh, like a, a cross up a priest's ass. Dude, you know what weirds me out more than any of this? Yeah. Though? 
is like how much the dude looks like the zombie Elvis that we see at Monster Palooza every year. Yeah, I mean, he looks it, it doesn't really look like Frankenstein's monster. And the movie ends with him hanging his penis because he's so ashamed of the, the fact that he's gay. Yeah, see, like looking at it through a modern lens, this movie's fucked up. But if you're an 18 year old laughing at dick jokes like when this came out, you're like, ah, it's a dick. Yeah, so like there there is a good head crushing sequence. If that's your thing. There is. Yeah. Yeah. With the... But I just wanted to mention it because it's so crazy. I, I I don't recommend watching it. It's it's Casey probably does. It's just it, it's it's really I, I probably wouldn't offensive. recommend watching it's it pretty, through modern it's pretty eyes. Offensive. If I if I if it was 1998 and I was in high school or just fresh out of high school, I probably would have said, oh, watch it. But, I, you know, I'm I'm more highbrow and I watch trauma movies. Yeah, I mean. That the, the, this is no, I'm I'm really saying that this is trauma movies are highbrow. In yeah, on on that on that token, Frankenstein's Castle freaks also pretty messed up. If you want to see a dwarf like rape a bunch of people, I uh, you know yeah, it, it's basically blood sucking freaks, but with like, like Neanderthal Frankenstein monsters. It's yeah, really weird. Yeah, I don't recommend that either. I still need to see Frankenstein Island, which I know Rift Tracks covered, and I hear that's way crazy. Um. Eh. <laughs> it's boring dude like it takes forever for anything to happen in that movie it? i i wouldn't recommend no. it uh maybe watch the riff tracks version how about this guys watch the hammer frankenstein movies watch the original trilogy especially with boris karloff watch abbott castellum and frankenstein the thing i discovered in this journey and i ended by watching curse of frankenstein with peter cushing who that movie is fantastic because i needed a palate cleanser there are so many different ways yeah. to adapt Frankenstein, depict the monster. It's endless. And uh, I hope that, you know, adaptations continue to be made from it because I don't think it's a story that should be lost to time. Future generations of kids need to know Frankenstein. So I'm, you know, I'm curious to see what comes out over the next few years. You know, we just got like a Dracula Netflix thing. I imagine some Frankenstein mm -hmm. stuff is in the works somewhere. So I want to see Frankenstein scary again. And so that's what I hope. That's why I like the Genji Ito thing is really you know, exciting. I hope to see like a scary Frankenstein adaptation and I think it can be done. Certainly. Yeah. So. I'm sick of seeing like modern revivals. I'm sick of seeing period pieces too, though. Like I really want to see something way outside the box, I guess is what That's I'm saying. That's why I liked the uh, conceptually Frankenstein theory is interesting. Not that like found footage needs to be everything, but I think that taking mm -hmm. like an old story like that and doing a found footage take on that, like doing someone should do a found footage take on like Dracula or the mummy, but like tie it into like, you know, the original universal monster stories that could be cool. So yeah, that was our Frankenstein show guys. Ugh, this was, this was a lot of fun. I, uh, I had a lot of fun talking about shout the out weirdest to big Frank Papa pump yeah. with the Frankensteiner. Um, it's ugh, Frankenstein, man. The, the most classic of universal monsters, really the horror genre wouldn't be much without Frankenstein. So thanks buddy. Thank you. Yeah, Mary thanks, Shelley. Thanks Mary Shelley. Yeah, and don't be one of those assholes that tries to discount Mary Shelley's place in history as a female science fiction author. Okay, she had a great place in it. People are always trying to downplay her. I don't know if it's out of sexism or out of just being a fucking asshole, which is kind of the same thing, but still. Um, yeah, dude, Mary Shelley deserves her place in history. Come on. Yeah, absolutely. So if you enjoyed what you heard, please follow us on Twitter under Another Miserable Podcast. Subscribe to us on YouTube under Another Miserable Podcast. If you like what we do, please consider leaving us a nice review, five stars on Apple Podcasts. It would really, really help us out. We would super appreciate it. Also, you can follow my co-host here, Casey. Where can they find you on the social media? Oh, yeah. I'm at Lucha Gringo. Um, yeah, we'll talk Frankenstein, bro. Come on. And you can follow me uh, on Twitter under Earth2Zach, Earth the number two Zach, Z-A-K. I also run the podcast Twitter as well, which is why I don't tweet as much as I should. I'm going to try and be more active on Twitter, guys. Once this rebrand isn't like in full effect, I'll be much more active there, I promise. So stay tuned. We have a lot more exciting announcements to come. This themed episode was just the beginning. Our next episode... We are doing Godzilla versus Kong, which I'm very excited to see. 
So yeah, dude. Yeah, I'm I'm reviews are all in on that. Reviews are already coming out, so I do not know where I'm gonna watch it. It makes me. I'm sad. not reading any of those goddamn reviews. <laughs> Give me the movie. <laughs> it makes me sad that I'm probably gonna have to watch this on my 32 inch TV. I'm gonna try and find like a drive in to go see it, but we'll see what happens. But uh, yeah, please. You can also follow us on Letterbox. By the way, we're both on Letterbox. I think my username is the same as my Twitter and my Instagram handle. Yeah, my mine definitely is. So yeah, Chris will hopefully be back with us then. But our good friend Kevin Connerelli will be joining us for that Godzilla vs Kong review for sure. Yeah, or we'll fucking kill him. <laughs> don't don't look look don't don't fucking burn us, Kevin. We know where you live, or at least I do. <laughs> all right guys have audio audio listeners i just did the thing to the camera where like i'm watching you but yeah no one can see me do it all right guys stay safe continue to wear your masks uh continue to wear your masks get vaccinated yo and uh fuck yeah dude by by our next show i'll be (laughs) fully back let's end this thing uh (laughs) yeah we'll see you guys next time later